I know we're all very excited to hear what Thomas, our speaker of, of today, uh, will present and tell us about today. And before that, there's three things that I would like to say. So bear with me for that. First of all, I would like to mention and also thank our partner for this year's series of Science Talks, which is the International Union of Architects, the UIA, and the World Congress of Architects that is hosted in July here in Copenhagen this year. This series of talks that we are hosting here are framing the International Congress in July, and we're therefore also taking the theme of the UIA Congress, which is the Leave No One Behind in connection with the Sustainable Development Goals. So the UIA and also we at, uh, at BlockSub with the Science Talks have identified architecture and urban design as a driving force to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. So over the next few months, we will focus in a total of nine Science Talks on how we can reach a future where we can leave no one and nothing behind. That was the first thing. Secondly, I want to explain why we are doing these science talks. With these science talks, we are inviting you, everyone, to participate and engage with researchers. And each science talk presents a current research topic that contrib contributes to many discussions amongst decision makers, practitioners, and scientists. So therefore, these science talks present in-depth knowledge on the trending topic. And lastly, before we jump into the scientific sphere and we listen to the science talk of today, I would like to say a few words about BlockSub. BlockSub was established in 2018 and it was established as an initiative to create a space where we can collaborate, form partnerships and bridge academia with practice. We strongly believe and we also practice every day that uh, collaboration across sectors and disciplines but also across academia and practice will pass the way out of the polycrisis that we are navigating within. BlockSub is a co-working space here in Copenhagen, but we are also an innovation hub in the field of sustainable urbanization. We are operating in three domains where we identify cities as nature, as systems and as communities. And within these domains, we have several activities and programs and we're doing a lot of matchmaking across businesses and science. Besides, our core values here at BlockSub are connect, share and scale. And events such as these science talks, they play an active part in achieving these core values because we're actively connecting with researchers all over the world, such as Thomas today. We are also sharing knowledge and experiences, and we're ultimately trying to scale solutions so we can be part of a system change and a paradigm shift towards a sustainable and regenerative world. So finally, let's now shift our attention to today's science talk and to Thomas Chapman. Thomas, he's a doctoral candidate in the chair of the history and theory of urban design at ETH in Zurich. And he's also the founder of an architecture and urban design studio called Local Studio in Johannesburg in South Africa. And he holds master degrees in architecture and urban design. In those, he explored the reintroduction of publicness into the post-apartheid city. And today he will, um, he will talk about strategies for rural urban impact in post-coal South Africa and how we can leave no one behind in these. There will be time and space for a Q&A after the talk. So for the ones of you online, you're welcome to post questions in the chat. We have a wonderful colleague, Freya, who will have a look in the chat. And for the ones of you in the room, there will be also time for you to ask questions afterwards. So without further ado, Thomas, the screen is yours. Good afternoon. Um, thanks very much for the introduction, Yuli. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, just a little bit about myself. I mean, it's a bit intimidating to be giving a science talk. I don't really consider myself a scientist, but uh, I'll try my best. I'm an architect and an urban designer from South Africa. Um, I spent the last 10 years running a practice called um, Local Studio in Johannesburg. I'm currently enrolled uh, in a PhD in the Chair for the History and Theory of Urban Design at ETH, um, which I'll speak a little bit about. 
And um, I must say up front that I'm very new to the field of development cooperation and impact investment more specifically. But this is something I think has huge potential when combined with some of the tools of architecture and urban design. All of my experience with alternative finance models comes from my role as a professional in donor-funded projects in South Africa. I just hope the clicker is working. Can I just see? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, a little bit about, about my PhD research. Um, my interests relate largely to the global networks of urban design that formed in the post-World War II period particularly in the South African context, where the disciplines of urban design, which essentially promoted a, a principle of shared space, encountered the apartheid system, which looked to universally separate people by race, class, and gender. Needless to say, South African cities are far more a product of apartheid than urban design, with minor exceptions, such as municipal civic centers, which were built by local governments across the country in the 1960s and 70s during the period known as high apartheid. My current, re my current PhD research looks at over 80 of these projects in the context of the liberal movement, which broadly opposed apartheid. So the image on the left um, is one of the ubiqu ubiquitous scenes of apartheid, specifically the spaces produced by the Separation of Separate Amenities Act, which looked to separate public facilities according to race. The, images, the image on the right is one of the civic centers I'm studying in South Africa, which was actually designed by the liberal Swiss architect Max Kirchhofer, who took a special interest in the multiracial use of public spaces he designed, despite the apartheid laws of the time. Um, here's another uh, one of the case studies I'm looking at. So my interest in these case studies from the 60s and 70s comes in the way in which urban designers employed pedestrianized public spaces to create new centralities within antisocial urban environments produced by apartheid policy and car-centric planning of the time. So obviously um, spaces which promote pedestrianization are, are nothing new to a city like Copenhagen, but in, in Johannesburg specifically and across South Africa, this really was, isn't had, and wasn't something that was done quite done so often. So it's, it's something I'm very interested in. Okay. Um, much of the design work I've done in my professional capacity in South Africa has dealt with this general idea. So that's the relationship between centrality and value. I'm interested in how the creation of new centralities at the scale of an urban block can forge a sense of value in a community. This is a pedestrian bridge and park we completed in an impoverished part of Johannesburg called Westbury for the Johannesburg Development Agency. And um, this is a, a tactical urbanism pilot we did recently in central Johannesburg. So you notice both projects deal with the taking over of vehicular roads um, to create new centrality in an urbanized area. Although I've focused or explored this notion a lot in the past in urban projects, today I want to focus largely on the potential of this kind of thinking in rural development in the context of the myriad of problems facing South Africa today. The most pro prominent of these problems being the energy crisis which the country is currently in. So I won't go into too much, uh, too much into this project. Suffice to explain that this was a, a youth hostel designed for a, a civil society organization in Limpopo. Um, the project took over an old wedding venue which is completely surrounded by nature reserve and farmland. But the population on the site at any, any given day is over 200 people. So in the end, you're, you're designing a small village with public spaces, which may not be like those in a city, but rather voids between buildings where gathering takes place. So we've come to define this, this idea as the bush plaza. It's a, an idea that, that captures the essence of, of this, this kind of ethos. And it's something we've been exploring more and more in, in rural projects. Um, so the project, yeah, so that's, um, you know, I'll go a bit more into this case study a bit later, but it's this idea of uh, um, new rural centralities. Okay, so just to, to briefly bring you up to speed with the um, South African context, so South Africa's landmass is approximately 91% rural. Um, the term rural in this case 
relates to undeveloped or agricultural land with an average population density of around 25 people per square kilometer. So this is the main quantitative measure I'll use to describe rural areas. From a qualitative point of view, what we're talking about here is relatively pristine countryside with very limited infrastructure and highly inadequate housing for the poor. So South Africa is highly urbanized compared to the rest of the continent, despite having a, a rural land mass of 91% with 67% of the population living in urban areas compared to the continental average of 43%. Um, despite this, um, the rural population of the country is still almost 20 million people. But if we're talking about a, population, a portion of the population who truly have been left behind, it is the rural poor. So on average, rural employment is twice that of, uh, rural unemployment is twice that of, of, of urban unemployment. So this differs from region to region, but can be over 50% of the population unemployed. So rural land in South Africa remains a, a contested and complex topic in the wake of apartheid, which ended almost 30 years ago. As the sociologist Cheryl Walker breaks down in her excellent book, Landmarked, the anti-apartheid movement at home and abroad thrived on a narrative of land dispossession. So this narrative reveals that due to colonial wars and land policies of successive white supremacist governments, 87% of the land came to be owned by 15% 50, of the population by whites. Before that time, once upon a time, African people lived in peace and harmony with their neighbors, with nature and with the ancestors. So this very simplistic but entirely true narrative was central to the process of nation building after apartheid ended in 1994. President Nelson Mandela's government instituted a process of land reform, which, re which reviewed claims of land dispossession between 1913, which was the date that the, that the Natives Land Act was passed, and 1994, when apartheid ended. Rural land in South Africa and, and, the, and the narrative of land dispossession occupies two distinctive realities in the present day. So the first is in the realm of populist politics, which focuses almost entirely on the problem of white-owned farmland in South Africa to stoke anger in a political base consisting mainly of poor black people. The second is in the, lamp, in the realm of actual reform. So in truth, only 10% of the total land mass of South Africa is arable. So that you know, is, is, is where, where productive farmland can grow, three quarters of which is indeed owned by white people. The South African government has rightly coupled land reform with rural development, but it's, it's focused it, its efforts in t almost entirely on agrarian transformation, with very little thought given to how the remaining non-arable 80% rural land mass, of, land mass of South Africa can function better for the country's 20 million rural inhabitants. So this is a land capability classification map which shows how the country is almost perfectly divided in two between a relatively arable and non-arable non land. Some of you may have heard in the news, if you follow the news in South Africa at all, about the energy crisis that is currently engulfing South Africa. Um, this is primarily a result of the electrification of rural areas after apartheid, which was done without any major increase in generating capacity. Most power in South Africa is generated via coal-fired power stations, the largest of which are over 40 years old and, and highly under-maintained. In addition to this, there is a global pressure to shift to renewable energy and the fact that government officials are reported to be siphoning up to 50 million euros a month from the power utilities coffers. So it's no surprise that on average South, Africa, South Africans experience up to 10 hours of power cuts per day. Returning to the map of arable versus non-arable land with an overlay of mining concessions, what makes sense scientifically, but is nevertheless striking, is that all the coal mining in the country and all the coal-fired power stations exist in the most arable parts of the country. Most of these power stations are in fact cooled using incredible amounts of potable water, and in their waste processes present immediate risks to water quality in the areas. 
Something I've been become interested in this regard is what is known as the water energy food nexus. And in South Africa, Dirty Power is fighting a war against water and food security. As it happens, the non-arable parts of the country, so that's the massive brown areas on the west of the map, contain some of the best solar and wind resources in the world. Although there's a lot of base grid development required to get the power generated from these areas to the areas of high demand, which obviously are, are, are mostly in, in the big cities and arable areas on the map, there's no doubt that in the next 10 to 20 years, non-arable rural parts of the country will undergo a major transformation catalyzed by the need for renewable energy. As I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm certainly no expert in impact investing, but I see great potential in this as a financial tool, which on one hand actively addresses the UN SDGs, and on the other acknowledges the highly privatized nature of the South African economy. According to a recent report by Ernst & Young, um, the main focus for impact investors in, in sub-Saharan Africa at the current stage is in renewable energy, fintech, and in healthcare. This certainly rings true in the immediate South African context where energy investments far outweigh other sectors. And this is entirely in the realm of renewables such as wind and power. So just to mention that as in some parts of the world, there's currently a massive fight in the country between coal and renewables with a push for renewables largely coming from the international community and from the liberal private sector. Now today I don't want to talk specifically about renewable energy, but rather the role that urban design should play in structuring the spatial relationships between rural catalysts like these and resident communities. Returning to what I said earlier, I'm, I'm interested in the, in the relationship between centrality and value. And I think that the fundamental role of urban design in this context is, is to create this value. And when I say value, it's as much about monetary value as about creating a sense of vitality. It's about creating places that people want to be in because of a unique combination of the natural and the urbane. So my basic hypothesis at this stage is that parallel investments in small scale rural development projects, which place emphasis on the creation of new centralities through the use of urban design instruments, can have immense measurable micro and macro impact in terms of the UN. SDGs. Now, the th this thinking is, is really nothing new in the global north, so to say, with a variety of scholarship exploring the various aspects of countryside, of rural urbanism and ruralism. And really not a lot of this looks at implications for developing countries where much of the focus still remains on cities. Um, I want to spend the next part of the talk focusing on a case study, so hopefully which illustrates a lot of the, a lot of the ideas that, I'm, that I'm, I'm raising, which was completed by my office last year. It's called the Lapalala Wilderness School. It's located in Limpopo province, which is a largely rural area located in the far north of South Africa. Um, some facts about the province. So um, it's, it's got six million people. Um, the unemployment Sorry, I saw we clickers. The unemployment rate is um, at 50%, so it's, a high, it's, it's incredible levels of unemployment. Um, it houses the most apartheid era homelands of all provinces. So what this means is that this was the only place in the country where non-whites were given long-term leaseholds on rural land during the apartheid era, which ended in 1994. So one of the biggest challenges facing the current democratic government is converting this leasehold into actual title we're a long way from this being resolved. So what you have is, is, is from a rural perspective, it, it's still quite low density, but, but still a lot of people spread out across this area with very little land security around, over land. Um, but the value proposition is that it's home to two out of the 10 UNESCO bios biospheres in South Africa. So it's, a, it's an incredibly beautiful place from a natural point of view. So the, the project site um, of the project um, I want to mention is, is called the Waterberg. Um, so it was, it was declared a UNESCO biosphere in, in 2001 and redeclared in, in around 2015. 
Um, the site of the project is a flat area defined on three sides by the curve of the Palala River and by a steep ridge on the east, which you can see in that picture. Um, I don't know if, my, if I can have a pointer that works, but this is the project site. It's been a, a human settlement site since the Iron Age, which is evidenced by some structures which still remain on the site. It's not a traditional school, but it's more of a biodiversity camp for school age learners to visit for a week at a time. So the school operates on a one for one model where half the schools who attend the camp pay and subsidize, subsidize the other half who can't. Most of the non-paying schools who make use of the facilities are from the surrounding areas. So from the Limpopo province. I want to talk about this project as a prototype for rural development, which could piggyback off larger funded initiatives in things like renewable energy, but also as a candidate for smaller scale impact investment in its own right. So the program of the project consists of a central hub, which contains all of the educational and social functions, as well as accommodation for students and visiting teachers. Um, the 23 permanent uh, teachers and staff chose to live in a, a separate little village um, developed slightly away from the central hub, which is where the pointer is now. Um, this is a closer view of the central hub and a view of the, the teacher's village. Before the project, the site had been used as a grazing area for cattle, um, because obviously because of its access to the river and, and clean water. And we mostly actually built on portions of the land that had been scarred because of overgrazing, especially for things like the solar plant. And just to mention that the project is a, a net zero building, it's completely off grid um, due to the solar plant, but also due to a grey and black water treatment plant and all drinking water being sourced from an aquifer, which was 84 meters below the ground. The temperatures in this area exceed 40 degrees Celsius in summer, so the buildings of the central hub are tightly packed together like a little medina. And in a rural context like this, where biodiversity is important, it makes sense to create concentrated pockets of development. And here's where the urban design logic comes in. When activities are intensified like this, vitality is created. We've, we've worked a lot on, on donor-funded projects in, in urban contexts, where issues of crime and failing infrastructure almost force a gated community topology. And to add to this, the services costs in urban areas are high for things like electrical connections and sewage disposal. But this doesn't necessarily mean that's, that these services are delivered. So as a donor, you'll end up paying twice for municipal and renewable solutions. And at present in cities like Johannesburg, um, donors or developers are seldom rewarded for being off grid as this removes a revenue stream for municipalities. So it's a somewhat sad situation. Just to explain briefly the, the program, so the central hub houses 128 students and six visiting teachers. The social functions of the site include a dining hall, a library, two auditoria and a variety of outdoor learning spaces. Um, most, of, most arrival to the site happens by bus and we had to, to build a new access road so that it was safe to drive down. Um, when X1 circulates the, the central hub um, undercover from, from, from the moment you arrive, so it's all this pedestrian circulation under pergolas or, or undercover from rain. So the central hub is really designed to have an urban energy, um, which is supported by aspects like the wayfinding system. The, the paths between blocks had to be sized specifically to avoid snakes and lit to avoid attacks from wild animals, which would not necessarily be a lion, but animals that can reach the school site from the river like hippos or crocodiles. At a small scale, 
the project allow, allows us to start questioning what non-motorized transport might look like in rural areas like this. I know there's some very interesting research being done around the world on the opportunities and limitations of cycling, for instance, in rural areas. But in the rural African context, this is something that really needs a lot more focus. Um, and just a in the, the access road with the, the bus access. So we had to we had to do quite a substantial access road to get to this place. So infrastructure costs to, to create a project like this, obviously, I mean, it's almost a 50-50 ratio of, of, of what you see on the ground or below the ground and what you see above the ground. So the central in the central hub, learning occurs as much outdoors as in indoor, as indoors. So this is the outdoor amphitheater, which um, looks onto a classroom. Um, this is part of the sinuous interconnected series of outdoor spaces, which fall under the heading of the Bush Plaza, as I mentioned earlier. And the main lecture space is um, open on either side, so it's uh, quite breathable. I think the climate obviously contributes to that. Um, and the central hub also contains medicinal gardens, vegetable gardens, defined by the, the residential blocks on, on either side. Um, Bush Plaza also includes swimming facilities, actually, the main purpose of which is to get um, students who, who can't necessarily swim to, uh, used to life jackets, which are used when swimming in the, in the Palala River. To speak a little bit about materiality of the project, so we wanted to use technologies which drew as much from the site as possible and opted in this in this sense for rammed earth and rock as the main construction materials, both of which are, are harvested directly from the site. Um, the reason for rammed earth is also that this is a relatively unexplored technology in South Africa. So very few projects have been done in rammed earth at this scale. So there's a, there was a, a substantial skills transfer that took place to local contractors that had been appointed on the site. A few glimpses of the interiors. So this is the reading room on the left and one of the student dorm interiors on the right. Project interiors are for the most part in this project very pragmatic so where maintenance is certainly required but can once again lead to a certain capacity building in in the permanent staff on site and this is um, certainly the case with um, with loose furniture so this, so this is the dining dining area all the hardware and furniture was designed specifically for this for the project with the idea that it could be repaired on site in the workshop so it's all very simple steel and wood Um, an important aspect of the project brief was this quite dirty or ugly back of house space where things like welding and carpentry take place, but it's also where vehicles are stored and repaired, and this is adjacent to the solar plant. Something to mention is that the school is, is linked to the adjacent Lapalala Wilderness Reserve, which is a, a 60,000 hectare reserve, which is home to the so-called Big Five, so that's lions and cheetahs and, and all the all the big safari attractions, but also a number of high-end safari lodges. And the school workshop we built is able to repair game viewing vehicles at a, at a fraction of the cost, usually due to those vehicles. You know, in, a, in, a, in a normal case, these vehicles have to get sent over 100 kilometers to the nearest town to be repaired. Um, and so it's this um, interesting aspect of capacity building and economic sustainability in these kind of stories, which are in the end positive externalities, not, not intended at the time. So the idea of a project is a more versatile public space um, is supported by catering facilities, which for instance can operate like a, a, like a restaurant or, or a bar. And I think I just, yeah, I just wanted to mention, I think there's a, um, when a facility like this is, is developed, even if the program is, is, is fairly narrow, like a school, there's an immense potential for further use as a multi-purpose civic space. So an example of this is that since opening last year, the school 
is being used fairly, fairly regularly as an imbizo space by the local government. Um, imbizo is a Zulu word which means gathering. So this is completely understandable when, when comparing something like this, which has been carefully designed and it's very comfortable for the climate, to the local government facilities close by, which exist in these areas, um, which apart from being completely dysfunctional, hardly promote this, uh, the idea of civic pride. So naturally there's a question of ownership in relation to public and private assets. And I think um, this is, it's, it's, it's not a, a cut and dried answer. And it's, a, it's definitely a topic which, which warrants more discussion. How does something become a community asset even if it's developed by a private entity? Um, just, um, you know, the, the, the catering facilities can function like pretty much like a fully fledged restaurant. Um, the last point um, I'd like to address is the question of sustainable tourism in the context of, of rural projects like this, which are not easy to reach. So I think there's great pot potential to promote a kind of tourism which involves much longer stays than a normal holiday. And so this would be aimed at researchers or people interested in conservation. And not only is this an opportunity for foreign income into these, into these kind of um, communities, but it can also enhance the credibility of places like this for global biodiversity research. Where architecture plays a role here is to create simple long-term accommodation which uses the natural environment to enhance the guest experience. So without it having to adhere necessarily to expensive five-star requirements. And um, just a view of the, the uh, as one of the facilities we created for visiting researchers to the school. Okay, so in conclusion, <laughs> the so I just wanted to say that this project, you know, it's it's it was not a necessarily an impact investment case. So it this was a, a purely donor funded project. Um, and the view of the donors was, was really something that, they, you know, it's, it's like a CSR project or something like that. Um, and there's a, there's a distinct um, disconnect between actual income into, into, into an initiative like this and, 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 the, and the development costs. However, I think it, it, it's an incredible case study to, to develop a, um, an impact case. So to say, how can, how can more of this kind of thing happen in rural areas? And, and it, it requires quite careful measurement, impact measurement, something that, that you know, we're, we're currently um, working on. And uh, we will be publishing this a bit later in the year. But just some brief takeaways um, in relation to what, what this case might, uh, might, what case might be made. So it's, it's around the idea of, of complete energy and water independence. Um, it's this kind of loose idea, but, but something I think is, is, is possibly um, measurable, the impact of this is measurable, it's the creation of a new centrality. So how do we create a new centrality for a municipality of this size, which, you know, it services about around two and a half thousand households. So it's not a small number of people. Um, what kind of jobs are created? So certainly um, short term, so the, uh, this, this building um, took about three years. So not, not insignificant, so around 300 construction jobs. Um, at various levels, not all obviously for the duration of the project, um, but at least 20% of this in, in training and new skills. So how does that how, how does that get, get get managed and planned more carefully? But more importantly, what are the permanent jobs that are created on site? So at this stage, it's 21, but but there's certainly room for 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 additional growth. Um, what is the main revenue stream of something like this? So certainly it's around education, as I mentioned. Um, schools from from big cities and, and actually across borders often will pay to come to to be part of the biodiversity program, and then this funds um, or this this the, it's the one for one model. But then there's 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 greater potential for for visiting researchers and um, how can this something like this become a a satellite office or a satellite station for 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 major academic institutions. Um, and then the secondary revenue stream, obviously, this is what I mentioned, which which ties to the to the visiting researchers, is this idea of ethical tourism and events, and the idea that it's planned for growth. So, can you do something like this? Can you make an initiative like this and plan for without you know? And I, I mentioned this in case this idea of intensifying activity within a certain area to protect, so that we don't go and 
Um, the idea is certainly not to to urbanize rural areas, but it's to it's to um, you you should we should be planning for growth. And I think in this case, the perfect example is that based on the success of the school, um, a separate donor is investing now in a biodiversity museum, which which will which with with space for for researchers as well, which will be built as part of that central hub. So planning for that kind of growth, um, and I think that's you know, that's quite a good potential there. Okay, so something that's perhaps being explored in, in places like Bloxab, but definitely not so much the developing world, is the, is the potential for architects and urban designers to become more actively involved in making investment cases like this for high impact projects. I think as professionals, we, we are uniquely positioned to not only package a complex um, range of range of impact factors, but also to bring this together um, spatially in in a responsible way. And I hope the case study and the the argument that I that I made earlier today illustrates this. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Thomas, for this amazing presentation. Um, at this point, I would like to open up the floor and the chat for some questions, if there is any. Otherwise, maybe I can start and then maybe while I'm having my first question, you can all think if you want to ask something and how to phrase it. But maybe just a short clarifying question that I had um, about the coal mining. Uh, you said that it made scientifically sense that they were all located in the most arable places in South Africa. Can you maybe explain why that is? I guess it's just the, you know, the, how, how, understanding how coal is formed, and um, you know, it, it's formed from organic matter that basically, um, yeah, compresses and 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 uh, and becomes the, the the ground beneath one's feet. So I think that's really really what it is. It's um, it's the it's the organic it's the mo it's the place where the, the most um, the, the, yeah it's the most arable parts of the, of, of most stuff grows, so that's um, and that what that's what ultimately makes the coal. So that's yeah, it's kind of a no brainer, but it's some but maybe it doesn't not yeah yeah not that it makes yet. sense. <laughs> mm. All right, is there any questions here in the room? Then maybe also something more personal for you, Thomas. What kind of inspired you personally to focus on a more rural de development since you're an architect and also an urban designer? And how do you see the especially rural development as the solution for out of the energy crisis that's happening right now in South Africa? Mm. I know you touched upon that, but maybe you can mm. elaborate a bit more. Yeah, no, it, it's actually not something I, I explained too much, but the in truth, there's a are the cities in cities in South Africa in 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 crisis right now. So there's a there's a energy crisis certainly, which which mainly affects cities, but there's also a governance crisis. So we've um, we have a system, and it's 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 completely unlike, um, I guess, what you have in Europe or in 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 South America, where where urban management or city management is not undertaken by um, at at a at a kind of it's not managed at a local level. It's all influenced by na by national politics, and our national political situation is a mess. So, so I think it's it, it, it's very hard to be a to be hopeful about about working in these contexts because you you're really going against the grain. And I think what what I it wasn't really my decision to start working in rural areas, but it, but obviously as architects we're consultants and we we go where where the work is and. And we were we've been approached to do a lot more of these kind of projects, and so obviously donors are feeling the same way. And I think it's this sense that what is the future of of of, of African um, and I say communities? And um, you know, there's a there's a big kind of post colonial case to be made where we, where we're saying the cities themselves are, are structures that maybe don't make sense for these societies anymore. But um, uh, you know. It, it goes without saying that the you know these these rural communities and these rural opportunities it feels a lot more there's a lot more possibility to do something really special and, and quite unique for a um for, for for south africa and i think the you know the, obviously the idea potentially is that more people start migrating back to rural areas and that that is that there's a certain um, you know with uh, and the one thing I, I didn't mention was the 
the amount of, of let's say 5g connectivity across across these areas it's, it's a very high so that's the one positive so so um so it's possible you know COVID taught us this that that these areas can become um you know the, the whole point is that they can, can they become centers again you know yeah yeah that's actually impressive because not even germany manages to have a 5g connection all over the country so <laughs> I think we have a question in the audience now. Sure. Hi, Thomas. Can can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, I'm Torben from BlocksUp in, in Copenhagen. And thank you very much for a very, very interesting uh, talk. Definitely um, making obvious for us that uh, South Africa is something completely different from Denmark, I, I have to say, especially your... I took took several things from from your from your great keynote here, uh, uh, especially the one about the, the the path being quite wide because of snakes. That was uh, not necessarily just amusing to us in the audience, but definitely something completely different from from paving paving Copenhagen. Uh, honestly, of course, no something completely different. Actually, I have two questions, but we might take them two one one at a time. Going back to your point about the the cow pot, the not the cow pot, the power cut. Sorry. The power cut in, yeah. in South Africa. Uh, I picked up that you said on, on an everyday basis there is a 10 hour power cut. Uh, has that, mm -hmm. uh, and to, to, to what extension and to, to, um, to what scale has that promoted the idea of creating off grid uh, sustainable energy solutions uh, national wide? Mm -hmm. could, you, could you develop a little, or just uh, double click a little bit on that, yeah. please? Yeah, so, so yeah, it's, it's something. Um, it's it's a no brainer that this that this should um you know this should be the thing so it's it's you know it's a little bit like a mini version of what's going on in, in you know with what what the rush what the ukraine invasion has done for for discussions around renewable energy in, in europe um but it's not so simple so the truth is we're sitting on we, we like the like the united states we have um we have a a, a, a lot of very conservative people in in power and um and and we have a huge coal reserves so currently the the, the lobby is, is 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 i wouldn't even say it's split 50 50 it's split at this stage probably 70 30 skewed towards still towards um improving coal uh, or, or more coal and and building more coal fired power stations the reason for this is is, is huge, largely political so um you know the political base of the country lives in coal mining areas and it's a lot of jobs that that will be lost. So it's a real it's a real risk, and I think there's definitely not the the um, foresight to start to think how can those jobs um, be 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 converted into into green jobs. Um, the other challenge we have is is the best. Um, I mentioned that some of the best wind and solar resources in the world exist in in non coal areas. The problem is that those areas have um, have very bad underlying um, electricity grids. So, so it, it, there's a there's a huge um, and I, I mean it's again it's something that you know if this was happening in De in Denmark this investment would have been made a long time ago. That base grid um, has to happen first, and that will unlock um, all these these potentials. But um, from the impact point of view, or from the external um, you know de development finance institution point of view. A lot of investment is coming in on, on in, in in those in, in solar and wind farms. So there's there's people really um, there's really banging down the door to try and get into these industries. But but what I would sad to say is it's it's not from a from a governance point of view it's not being very well managed. But but from my for, where we come from from a spatial point of view this is where I'm interested in is how do you what do what do these massive things do to a, a community and how do, how can we design those interfaces and I think that's the um, you know that's the thing that I'm most interested in. So um, to wrap up the answer, I think the, 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 we're looking at probably at a five-year horizon for the infrastructure to catch up, the base infrastructure, um, and then then there's going to be a lot more um, certainly solar and wind being built in, in in that area on the west of the map, which is called the, which is mainly the Northern Cape. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that answer. And Tom, did you have a second question or? We can see if there's some other questions. Otherwise, Torben, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, thanks again, Torben. Here, uh, uh, thanks for that uh, that 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 answer. Of course, it, it raises the uh, uh, the not a, not necessar not necessarily the concern, but the potential of when when this. I've, what I actually take out of your answer on on the uh, 
hmm. on the renewable energy uh, part there is that it basically requires the infrastructure to to roll out the uh, in, in uh, the uh, renewable energy uh, sources, so to speak, there's sort of a structural lock-in mm. situation created in mm. South Africa, mm. uh, as you uh, as you very directly uh, describe it. But what mm. about sort of micro uh, renewable energy uh, uh, systems, so mm. to speak, um, yeah. going down to the individual dwelling, the individual house, the individual yeah. building, etc., yeah. with solar panels on the roof yeah. and and uh, yeah. and yeah. and using the, uh, yeah. the wind energy there. Isn't there a push for mm. that, given the fact that you have yes. this structural login? Yes, no, there, there, is a big, um, there is a big push for that. And I think it is happening. I think what we, we're, we're at the mercy of now is obviously supply chain issues. And, there's, and it's, a, it's a very unregulated market. So pricing is, is, is not, um, pricing is, is you know, is, it just, it's just crazy for those sort of systems now, as you can imagine. So, but, but, but certainly those who can afford it, um, you know, I'd say there's probably if I'm being generous, 15 to 20% 20, 20 of the population you could afford to put solar on their roofs. So it needs to be a lot more, um, you know, the, the, the case study that I showed at the, at the, at the end, the, the La Palada School, I think the, the point of that is to say, you know, that, that's something that's, that it's a completely, you know, the, the solar farm was part of the project and it's, um, you know, that's, you know, there, there's a case there to be made where you can almost invent a little um, activator like that, and it'd be completely energy and, and, and water independent. It's, it's totally doable, um, and that that's definitely in the short term. That's that's the answer. It's going to be these smaller scale interventions. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much, Thomas. Is there any more questions? Ah, we have one in the chat or by Freya. I'm not sure. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for your talk. You were saying that you were in. South Africa figuring out the role of the urban planner and the architect. And I was curious in this case, what you saw your own, like the role of those two types of, of planners and architects. Mm -hmm. And also like, are you the expert? Are you the facilitator of a co-creation process? How much are the community engaged? Yeah, and mm -hmm. what, type of, what type of architect and urban planner mm -hmm. you saw in mm -hmm. that case? Thank you. Yeah. So there's the, I mean, I think there's the, there's what happened, which was, um, we were given a, we were given a brief for a, for a quite a large project, but, but there was not a, really not a sense on the, on the side of the client that this could be something, I want to say urban, but, but something that had a, 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 that had public space, that had a sense of vitality, and that would be a, a kind of open facility that not only it, um, responded to the direct needs of uh, you know the, of the program, which is which is a wilderness school or, or a biodiversity training camp, so so I think we reinterpreted that brief and we um, we, we turned it into something um, you know something that something more and and I think in that sense that's 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 mainly where the, where the envelope was pushed and then certainly around things like materiality and and all that job creation I think that that was um, that was our our initiative. I think what I'm more interested in is how does how does this you know I, I'm super excited about about uh, developing an impact case study or a, a case for more of these projects and for this to be generated from 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 my side or from from, from my office's side. So can you know can as architects and we we I mean I don't know if it's the same in in in, in Denmark, but there's there's always this romanticism with. Um, architect becoming a developer and being his own his own client and all that all that stuff and i think it always falls these ideas certainly in the south african context always fall flat because um profit is always the the driving factor you know and i think um when it comes to a project like this i think there's so many um other benefits related to the, the sdgs i think financing becomes a totally different conversation when you're when you're when you're um, developing a project like this it has to have an income stream but but possibly profit to investors can come from other way, in in other ways, so that's um, that's the idea. Is can can architects and urban designers actually take a role in 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 actually raising impact in finance for this? Thank you, Thomas. Is there any questions, reflections? Doesn't necessarily have to be a question. <laughs> All right. Otherwise, if there's no reflections or comments or questions then I would say we give you, Thomas, another huge applause. And thank you for joining us here today. And I hope, or maybe we wait with until applause, until I announce that we also have our next uh, 
science talk lining up on the 20th of April. So I hope I'll see many of you there. Um, on the 20th of April, we'll have Sue Rio joining us from Aarhus School of Architecture. She will talk about urban seascaping and how we can create a life where we can live not just by the sea, but with the sea. So thank you everyone for participating both here in the room and also online. And thanks, Thomas, for this presentation. Thank you.